Just gonna wait for the uh, studio to be ready. We're good. So you're gonna have to forgive me a little bit because I need to figure out whether or not I remember how to do this. You would think that two weeks wouldn't be enough, but <laughs> should have seen me driving the first day we got back. I wanna thank you again uh, for being here today. Uh, even as I go and say that we, you know, I'm kind of like rough around the edges and all that kind of stuff, it really was wonderful to have a time away, uh, not from you, but just from the grind. <laughs> I need to be very specific about that. We missed you terribly. I did not miss my office. But it is good to be back in a place where I don't feel like I'm being roasted alive every day. Uh, it's especially good to be back with our church family, and we are ready to dive back into Ephesians with you this morning. So for anyone who needs to be caught up on what's going on around here, I see a few new faces around here. Again, love that you're here. Very glad for that. Uh, looking forward to connecting uh, either after the service or at another time. Uh, but for anybody who needs sort of a, a catch-up in what's been going on, uh, we are in our fourth week in this series through the book of Ephesians together. Uh, I gave the example uh, earlier on in this series of why we're doing this, and I gave this example of a group of people going on a camping trip together uh, who all agree to go camping but quickly discover upon arrival that everyone's definition of authentic camping is different and how that kind of a situation might lead to tension, conflict, division, name-calling. The same can be said of the church. We may all agree that the church is important in the life of a believer, but our definitions of what church is and how it works may differ radically uh, between individuals, even in, uh, between groups. The reality is that because culture and language and sensibilities change over time, the church must be adaptable in order to reach people in a way that they can understand and be a part of. To be adaptable without compromising on the message and the mission of the gospel, it's a good idea to establish how Scripture defines the identity, values, and mission of the church to ensure that we do not stray from anything that is core to what the gospel has to say, it is a good idea to come back to Scripture and see what it has to say about the core things of the identity, the values, and the mission of the church. So far, uh, through, through our, uh, our walk through the book of Ephesians, so far we've seen how the church, uh, God's holy representatives, in creation, his people, how they, the church, have always been God's intention since before creation. Next, we heard that the church is blessed with the indwelling presence of the Spirit so that, like Abraham, the nation of Israel, and those who came after, others will also be blessed. Last time I was here, we heard that the blessing is only made possible through Jesus and that the witness of the church must reflect that fact. The witness of the church must reflect the fact that it is only through salvation, or salvation is only possible through Jesus. Not by any cleverness or any works that we've done. Only through Jesus. This week, we're going to take a look at how Paul follows up that message by taking a look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 14 through 18. If you have a Bible with you, I will invite you to join me there, Ephesians chapter 2, uh, verses 14 through 18. If you don't have a Bible with you, the words will be up on the screen. But as you're making your way there, I want to try to give you a bit of a, uh, I want to paint a bit of a picture for you as a suggestion of how, how to understand this passage this morning. Now, picture an on-ramp on the highway. We're all aware of what this is. If you don't, I don't know how you got here this morning. Picture an on-ramp that leads to an overpass. Now, an on-ramp functions as a way for traffic to flow freely from one, uh, in a, into a new direction. Now, of course, there are rules to an on-ramp. You need to be able to slow down to a certain speed, otherwise you're going to go careening off. You need to be able to yield to others, otherwise you're going to be having a lot of problems. There are rules to an on-ramp, but by its function, it is a way of taking traffic from a highway and making it so that it can go into a new direction by flowing freely without having to stop and interrupt traffic. But if there are speed bumps, 
excessive road signs or barriers that restrict access to the on-ramp, then the ramp stops functioning the way that it's supposed to, and it becomes a slow, stressful, inaccessible mess, which on a day like today is not great. You have that picture in your head uh, as we go into this passage. I think it gives us a good way of kind of understanding what Paul is talking about when he writes this to the Ephesians. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 14 through 18. It says this. I'm going to be reading from the NIV this morning. For he himself, Jesus, for he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups, Jews and Gentiles, one, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of the law, with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. And in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we have access to the Father by one spirit. As Paul continues to build his case for the identity, vision, or values and mission of the church, This passage is laying the groundwork for unity by by demonstrating that that a covenant relationship with God is available for all people, not just a select few. He's building up to those verses in chapter 4 where he's going to be talking about unity, bearing with one another, all those things. But he's setting the basis for that unity in the fact that a covenant relationship is possible and available to all people through Jesus. Ultimately, this passage applies to Christians today as the basis for living in peace by showing that Jesus fills the gaps between believers. Jesus fills the gaps between people who follow him. Because we are so diverse, because there are so many different opinions, and because there are so many different ways of doing things, It is good to know that we can have unity based on the fact that Jesus fills the gap between believers. To understand how this applies to believers today, it's important to take a look at what was happening historically around this passage so that we can understand what it is that Paul was trying to reference to. Now, if you remember back about five weeks ago, and honestly, who does? I'm pretty sure I had toast this morning. Probably trying to remember what we went grocery shopping for. So I don't expect you necessarily to remember five weeks back, but if you are curious, messages are recorded there on our our YouTube page. You can take a look back at that. I did say this, though, that that Ephesians is a unique letter in in the Bible. It's a unique epistle because it's not actually written to address a specific issue that was going on in that church. In the other, you need to understand that in the early church, there was a fair amount of controversy that went on. I've said this before, but it bears repeating. The church in the first century was a new concept in so many different ways. It should come as no surprise that the message of the gospel, as, sorry, that as the message of the gospel spread to churches, Uh, that were established in uh, in a number of areas that as those churches were established through the empire, some issues started to rise up, whether they were regional or they were uh, widespread. You can point to almost any letter in the New Testament and see an issue related to a misunderstanding or a misinterpretation or just people being people. For instance, If you look at a passage that we repeat quite often on Communion Sundays, it's uh, Corinthians 11. 1 Corinthians 11, you see that there is something wrong with the way that the church is practicing the Lord's Supper. We go through that whole thing of Paul going and saying, and I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself, that on the night he was betrayed, da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da. Did he just da-da-da-da-da over the words of Jesus? Yes. Yes, he did. But... We have that passage of Paul going and describing what the significance of communion is. However, he's bringing it up with these people because there's an issue with the way that they're practicing communion. The Corinthian, in the Corinthian church, there were a bunch of rich people in that church that were treating the communion supper, the Lord's table, like some big pagan feast, and they were completely gorging themselves on stuff and getting drunk 
in a Christian service, while poorer people in the congregation kind of looked on and were like, can I, can I have a piece? No. There was a misunderstanding about what was going on with communion in that place, and so Paul had to address this issue with these people. In this passage, like I said before, Ephesians was not written to address a specific problem in the church, but you can see in this passage that Paul did not write to the the Ephesians to call on a specific issue, but he does intentionally address a widespread issue in the church at the time, which revolved around the issue of just how Jewish do you need to be to be involved in this new Christianity thing? It's a crass way of putting it, but it's the best way that I can think of. Now, if you're wondering why this is such a stumbling block for the early church, the answer is kind of complex. But here's a short, a short answer to a very big question. Up until that point in the story of the Bible, the concept of a faith community in terms of being committed to God Yahweh, the uh, Israelite God. The concept of a faith community was wrapped up in temple worship and specifically in the chosen status of the people of Israel. Again, bear in mind that during this time, this was so early on in Christian history that congregations were still gathering in synagogues. This is where the gospel was being spread in synagogues in different cities. And Christianity at this point was still considered sort of a fringe sect of Judaism. Now, this wouldn't be much of a problem if not for one little fly in the ointment, which is this, that human nature has not changed since the Garden of Eden. It wouldn't have been such a big deal that, you know, there were Jewish people and Gentile people mixing in this thing if not for the fact that human nature is what it is. Here's an example of what I'm talking about. This isn't biblical, but I'm going with it anyway. How many of you here have an iPhone with you? Not, not, not just an Android or whatever, but like an actual iPhone. Now, thank you for putting your hands up. I appreciate that, and I want to make sure that you know this. From the bottom of my heart, I am not calling you out, okay? I am not picking on you. I'm simply making an observation, okay? So that disclaimer out of the way, here goes the story. When I was in university, I applied to work at an Apple store, partially because I thought I was attractive enough, I wasn't. Uh, <laughs> I applied to work at an Apple store, and part of their hiring process, which was very strange to me up until this point in time, every hiring process that I've been involved in was my dad got me the job, or I sat in on a short interview, and they decided whether or not I could sell people hot dogs. This interview was very different because it wasn't actually an interview. Everybody who had applied to work at the Apple store was invited to this great big orientation seminar. They invited everyone who had applied to this conference room in the basement of a hotel, big, big, beautiful room, to hear this presentation about the Apple computer company. I was like, okay, they're giving me snacks, I guess I can go with this. The whole thing, when you get down to this whole thing, like when going through the entire presentation, the whole thing was all about how wonderfully successful Apple and its products are. They used words like innovative, beautiful, ergonomic. I had some other ones written down here because they're not part of my regular vocabulary. Uh, Yeah, revolutionary, things like this. They were describing their products in such incredible terms that it was almost like they were proselytizing. Proselytizing, that's the word. I was speaking caveman Spanish for about a week here. You've got to forgive me. In any case, they talked their products to describe their stores and their computers and their phones and their tablets. They were using all these big, beautiful words to describe all this stuff. And I was sitting in there for about an hour and 15 minutes listening to this presentation with all these slides and videos and things that just made you feel great about the product. As I sat there listening, I realized something, that I wasn't actually in an orientation or a job interview. I was being inducted into a cult. That was a lot funnier than you thought it was. You have to understand that Apple technically is a tech company. They sell computers, phones, tablets, earbuds. 
all sorts of things. But as a policy or as their vision, they are not trying to sell you a computer or a phone or a tablet. They're trying to sell a lifestyle. Apple people, and I'm not picking on you people here who have Apple phones. I get it. Okay? So please, I'm not. But Apple people, and I don't know if you've ever met these Apple people before. They're insufferable. We love you anyway, but the ones who have bought into the message and have made Apple like a part of their personality or a part of their identity actually look down on other people who use other products. I experienced it when I was in university. I experienced it when I was working at uh, other churches. They look down on others and the PC, Android, and I'm just like, Listen, man, it's got four wheels and it runs. It's getting me from point A to point B. I don't care. But they do look down on other people, or some of them do look down on other people. I shouldn't be quite so, so judgmental. Now, I will admit that Apple does make a good computer, but ultimately, it's just a computer or a tablet or a phone. Now, I've said that exact same thing to Apple people, and the response that I get from them is like they are fighting for their life. My point is this, that human nature will take almost anything, anything, and twist it in a way, or twist it into a reason to elevate ourselves or to differentiate ourselves or to separate ourselves from other people, even something as dumb as which phone brand you use, Pepsi or Coke. Human nature is that we will find anything that we can to differentiate ourselves, separate ourselves from, and elevate ourselves above others. Now, this was the issue that Paul was addressing in this passage. Imagine for a moment being brought up in a community that emphasized that you are unique because you are one of God's special chosen covenant people. Now, for the Jewish people, this was and is true. We know this from Scripture, that God has not removed that covenant nature or that covenant relationship from his people. It's a sacred privilege, but what, happen, what happens when that privilege gets twisted by human nature? God had given them this relationship for a reason, but it turned into a way of going and differentiating themselves, separating themselves, and elevating themselves above others. A very common issue in the early church was that Jewish believers would often look down on Gentile believers because they were not a part of God's covenant people. They would burden them with extra rules and regulations and you need to do this and that in order to belong. And this is not just speculation. This is a fact that Paul points to several times in his writings. If you look at Galatians, Galatians chapter 2, you can read about an incident where Peter... Peter, who back in Acts had received a vision from God showing him that salvation belonged to the Gentile people as well. Peter, who was called to preach to the Gentiles as well. He separated himself from Gentile believers in his church in Antioch when a group of Jewish believers came in. There was this separation between the circumcised believers and the uncircumcised believers that went beyond a little bit of skin. It was the Jewish believers that had set up a barrier that set them apart from these lowly Gentile believers. And this was a widespread problem that was damaging the unity of the churches all over. And that's why Paul built this into, the, this into his case for the identity, values, and mission of the church when he said, for him, for he, Jesus, Himself is our peace who has made two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility by setting aside in his flesh the law and its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away, and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. The message here is clear. 
when you see the context of everything going on around it. There was no difference. There was to be no difference between Jew and Gentile anymore. Because of Jesus, there's no basis for separation, suspicion, hostility, or superiority. Everyone comes to salvation and everyone receives atonement through Jesus only. We all have access to the throne of God by the same Spirit living in us, and there is no basis for separation anymore. Before we get to the application of this, I want to cover a couple of things. I want to emphasize this. This message does not negate God's covenant promise to his people. We know from Scripture that God never changes and that He remains faithful to His promises. So that means that the church is not swept in as a replacement for the people of Israel. The people of Israel did not fail out so hard that God abandoned them. Romans 11 tells us that like branches grafted onto a tree, the church has been grafted into God's covenant promise. Romans 11, 17 through 18 says this, If some of the branches have been broken off, and you, though a wild olive shoot, have been grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing sap of the olive root, do not consider yourself to be superior to those branches. In other words, you didn't replace anybody. You're not better than everybody else just because you've been grafted on in the place where others broke off. The vine still cherishes the native branches that were on it. If you do... If you do consider yourself superior, if you do have some sort of an attitude about this, consider this. You do not support the root, but the root supports you. The warning that Paul gives in that passage is much the same as the message that he gives to the Jewish believers in Ephesians. Do not get arrogant about your place in God's plan. Don't get arrogant about your place in God's plan because ultimately we must realize that we have no life unless we remain connected to our source of life. The church has not replaced Israel. The church is the continuation of God's redemptive program for the world that started with Abraham and has only grown since. God remains faithful to his covenant people. Here's the other thing I want to cover. This message does not mean that the law has been abolished and no longer applies. When we look at a lot of this stuff, I I hear from so many people, they're confused. Well, if we have this New Testament, then why do we keep all this stuff over here? What's the point? If everything keeps on going and saying that the law is gone, the law is gone, is the law gone? No, absolutely not. This does not mean that the law has been abolished and no longer applies. Again, God is consistent. And Jesus himself said that not one part of the law will ever fade away. So how can we reconcile this idea that salvation comes by faith in Jesus and not through the law? How is it that we reconcile the idea that the law is not gone, but that we only receive salvation through Jesus? The answer is actually quite simple. It's because Jesus is the fulfillment of God's law. Faith in him fulfills the whole law. Go back to Ephesians 2, verses 14 and 15. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. He took that all on himself. There was a time when God's chosen people were called to separate themselves from the nations around them. I, I'm, I'm doing a, a year-long read through the Bible right now again, and uh, right now I'm in the book of Numbers, and you can see through the books of Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers just how separated the people of God were from the nations around them. Even the fact that they were coming into a country to destroy people in order to take over their land shows just how separated they were from the others around them. There was a time when the people were called to separate themselves from the nation around them. They were called to be a nation of priests, totally dedicated to God's law, demonstrating what a nation that follows God looks like. Now, according to Romans, the law was given to demonstrate the incredible price of holiness. We see that the law was not bad, but it, in fact, goes and highlights 
just how lost we are without a Savior. The fact that nobody can make that cut. The price of holiness really is separation, sacrifice, and unyielding focus on the law. Perfection that none of us can step up to. It's a heavy burden. That it was the heavy burden of the old covenant. But we see in Jesus something new happening as he fulfills this covenant. If you look at Hebrews chapter 7, it says this in verses 22 through 25. Jesus has become the guarantor of a better covenant. Now, there have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing in office, but because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Jesus took up all the requirements of the law in himself, and he permanently intercedes on behalf of those who believe in him. Through Jesus, the requirements of the old covenant have been satisfied, and now he offers this new covenant that is available to all who trust in him for salvation, no longer limited to a specific group of people, but to the world. There is no more barrier. The veil has been torn so that all people can be made holy before God by faith. So where does this leave us for today? Hopefully with a lot of gratitude. And here's what I want you to consider as we wrap up our time together. I said before that one of the things that I wanted to take away from this is that Jesus fills the gaps between believers. And here's what I mean by that. We are surrounded by, and I don't want to give this scary thing where the outside world is a scary, hostile place. That's not my intention at all. I'm just acknowledging this. We are surrounded by messages that are designed to segregate and divide us by fostering suspicion, hostility, and fear of the people who are different from us. If we can be separated over what brand of phone you use, or if somebody can come to a fist fight because one person prefers RC Cola over Pepsi, it's not too many steps further for some more serious stuff to really separate us. This attitude is insidious because it can disguise itself as virtuous and logical. We can fool ourselves into thinking that these differences should separate us. It's true that the church must remain true to its core values, its core calling. But it's also true that the church is made up of diverse people with diverse needs and diverse backgrounds. We're not homogeneous. We are diverse. As a church, we need to be able to identify the things that are at the core of who we are and agree on those core, fundamental, foundational things together. And allow the grace of Jesus to fill the gaps between us when we don't see eye to eye. For the people of the early church, the message was, not to, let to, or it was to not let the old traditions and requirements of the law get in the way of being unified. Don't hold your holiness or your marked differently or your, your being marked differently or whatever else. Don't hold that over somebody else and make a separation between you and them. It's not necessary. You've been made one through Jesus. For the people of the early church, the message was not to let the old traditions and requirements of the law get in the way of being unified in the mission of the church. The same is true for us today. We have our own version of this in our traditions and practices and things that we hold dear to ourselves. As new people, people begin to join us, as people who have not experienced church before begin to join us, as people who are new to faith or people from a different faith tradition begin to join us, we're going to find that their convictions may differ wildly 
Their sensibilities may differ wildly. Their understanding, their level of maturity, all these things may differ wildly from what we've experienced before. Their convictions and sensibilities may differ wildly from our own. When that happens, we need to learn to lean on the fact that Jesus fills the gap between believers. And we need to be gracious with others as they come in, especially if they are new to faith. Don't burden them with the things that we think are necessary because they're tradition. Don't burden them with requirements simply because we've always done them. This is why it's so important to be so familiar with what Scripture actually has to say. To be so familiar with those core tenets of what we are called to, what it looks like to follow Jesus. So that we don't separate ourselves or overburden others as they're coming in with the things that are unnecessary. Seasoned believers need to be willing to trust that so long as we are all serving the same Jesus, so long as we are all focused on the same Savior, and are all faithful to the same gospel, that Jesus will fill the gaps between us. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with all its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. When we move into Ephesians chapter 4, we're going to talk a lot more about unity, but my challenge to you today is this. Have you identified the things that are central to the gospel, and are you willing to be gracious for the things that are not? As we move into a season where we are praying that we will grow by inviting new people into our fellowship. This will be critical to how we minister to people who are unsaved or newly saved as they enter into our presence. I'm going to pray with you. I'm going to invite the band forward one more time. Lord Jesus, we ask that as, uh, as we draw our time together here to a close, that, Lord, your spirit would be working in our hearts right now. God, we know that you love us, and we know, God, that you celebrate the things that, uh, that we do that are in union with you. So I pray, God, that you would encourage each person here as you show them the ways that they are following you faithfully. God, as you show them the ways that they are leaning into your mission, demonstrating your gospel, bringing mercy and peace to those who need it. And God, for the areas of our hearts that are not surrendered yet, or for the places that have become habit, places that are not central to your message, to your gospel, to your mission on earth, Lord, I pray that by your spirit you would start melting away those walls that you would show us those things and you would make us receptive to your spirit. That, God, you would make us careful to not throw away things that are central to your gospel. That, Lord, we would be built on solid rock foundation and not shifting sands. But, God, as we look for that solid foundation, as we firm up our identity in you. God, give us grace, humility, 
and the ability to cast aside the things that hold us back, the things that we hold so dear that may hold others back. We pray, God, that you would use us to further your kingdom in our community and around the world. We may we pray, Jesus. Amen.